Hi, everyone. We'll just give folks a couple more minutes to, to go ahead and keep joining. Um, I know we had a lot of signups, so I, I want to let people come in for a couple more minutes. Um, Mike, feel free to start sharing your presentation whenever, and we'll get started here in a couple minutes. Thanks, Allie. Kelly, what screen am I sharing? Is it coming up as a full screen? Yeah, we're seeing your PowerPoint. It looks good. Thanks. Sure. Well, let's go ahead and get started just for the sake of time. Thank you everyone for being here. I am Ellie Doles Lane. I'm the Deputy Chief of Staff in the Mayor's Office. I've been working on the High Skill Immigration Fund um, for the past year within Focus. Um, we are on our second year now of the High Skill Immigration Fund, which is a, a, a set um, grant program that allows businesses to de-risk um, H-1B sponsorships. So we'll, we give grants to businesses who decide to take the, the risk of, um, of sponsoring an H-1B visa. Um, so today we have the, um, the great pleasure of being with Michael Durham from uh, Barnes & Thornburg. He has been practicing immigration law exclusively for the past 17 years, and he's experienced in the complex and dynamic nature of immigration laws and regulations. Um, he is going to give us a presentation about hiring international talent through the H-1B visa pro sponsorship process. There will be, um, I know some of you will have very specific questions, but just remember that Mike can't, it can't give you any legal advice in this um, webinar. So if you have specific questions, I'd encourage you to contact um, Mike directly. Um, I'd also encourage you to leave your questions in the Q&A function up at the top of your team screen. Um, we will have a little time for Q&A at the very end, um, and we can try to address any questions that we, we deem appropriate. So um, very specific questions may not be able to be addressed. So just, just putting that out there. Um, I'd also like to share the High Skill Immigration Fund's webpage with you, and I'm, I'm putting that in the chat now. Uh, go ahead and, and give it a look when you can. That's where we add any new events that are coming up. Um, and I'll give you a little bit of a preview of some of the events we're having in the coming months at the end of the presentation, but I want to give um, Mike uh, plenty of time to go through this. This is very complex. Um, you know, H-1B sponsorship is very complex, and I know that he has lots of good information to give. So, uh, Mike, go ahead and take it away. Hey, thanks for the introduction, Allie. And thanks, everybody, for making time out of your busy schedules um, to attend this presentation here. What I normally like to start with um, are some immigration terms and acronyms. And a whole lot here. Trying to figure out, there we go. Um, some immigration terms and acronyms and relevant government agencies here. Um, some immigration terms to start off with, we've got U.S. citizen, and those are individuals that are born in the United States or born abroad to U.S. citizen parents or adopted or naturalized, that they were a legal resident beforehand and they naturalized and became a U.S. citizen. 
We also have U.S. nationals that you may encounter. Um, all U.S. citizens are U.S. nationals, um, but we have some U.S. nationals that are not U.S. citizens. Basically, it's a legacy um, of our history um, with our territories. And right now, I believe it's only limited to American Samoa and the Swain Islands. Um, and those individuals will also have employment authorization here in the United States. And we have U.S. legal residents. Um, those are commonly the folks with the green card. The cards are actually green again with immigration. For a while, they were not green. Um, these individuals are not U.S. citizens. They can't register to vote or vote in the United States, um, but they have permanent permission to reside and work in the United States. The green card um, has an expiration date. They're normally valid only for two years or 10 years, but the individual simply needs to renew their card. Um, they have permanent permission to reside and work in the United States. Unlike a U.S. citizen, though, a U.S. legal resident can be removed from the United States. They can be deported for crimes or they can abandon their U.S. legal residency. We also have asylees and refugees. Um, these are individuals um, with permission to reside in the United States based on persecution back in their home country, um, based on a protected classification. Um, refugees are processed abroad at a refugee camp um, and then they enter the United States if they're selected for the United States. Otherwise, they would be processed and and entered into a different nation. Asylees are individuals that have made it to the United States um, and then presented their claim for asylum, which has got the same legal basis as a claim for refugee status. And when asylees are someone who's been granted asylum, um, not to be confused with persons that are applying for asylum in the United States, um, when folks are applying for asylum after the clock, after 180 days of their application has been pending, they can apply for an employment authorization document. We've got a huge backlog in our immigration court. So you may encounter um, individuals that are your employees that are applying for asylum. They have an employment authorization document, but they haven't received um, their grant of asylum. They haven't won their case yet. Um, we have other individuals that are here on temporary status. Um, that temporary status may or may not confer employment eligibility. So, for example, we have individuals here that are on tourist status. They don't have employment eligibility. Uh, we have individuals here on student visa status that may have employment eligibility later on. Um, and we have other individuals with temporary status that have employment eligibility. For example, folks on H-1B status um, have employment eligibility. That's a temporary visa classification. Finally, we have a group of individuals that are undocumented. Um, those are either individuals that entered the United States without permission or those who entered with permission and overstayed. Um, some additional immigration terms and acronyms. An I-9, hopefully all of you employers know what an I-9 is, the Employment Eligibility Verification Form, required for all hires after November 1, 1986. Um, this was because of a compromise we had with Tip O'Neill and Ronald Reagan, where for the first time ever, employers were imposed with the burden of verifying the identity and employment eligibility of new hires. Um, which didn't exist beforehand. And then the, the trade-off was there was a mass legalization program at that point for a lot of um, undocumented and documented farm workers in the United States and other individuals. So we had this compromise that we don't seem to have today, uh, but we had one in the 80s that led to the I-9 process. A visa. Um, a visa is actually a document that's inside of a passport um, that's used to enter the United States, okay? Some individuals are visa exempt. Um, us U.S. citizens are visa exempt. When we go to a nation like Canada or a lot of the nations in the EU or other parts of the world, we're, we're allowed to go without the encumbrance of applying for like a tourist visa to go visit that nation. And we reciprocate with some other nations as well where they're able to enter the United States without a visa itself. But generally, an individual needs a visa to enter the United States, um, especially for employment. Um, issues. If you're going to be here on an H-1B visa, you normally need an actual visa inside of your passport, um, other than Canadian citizens, which are being exempt in a lot of classifications. Unlike a visa, the I-94 is a document that's conferred by immigration once someone's entered the United States. So um, an individual abroad would apply for a visa to enter the United States if it's granted by a U.S. Embassy or Consulate. When they uh, fly into O'Hare or you know LAX or GFK or wherever they fly into, Immigration would review their passport and visa, ask them some questions, and if they're granted permission to enter the United States, they're, they're issued an I-94 document. It used to be a white card that was stapled inside the passport. Now it's a document that the foreign national needs to go online and secure from the Customs and Border Protection website. Some I-94s confer employment eligibility, others do not. 
Um, but the I-94 is often a document that you would use for the I-9 for your new hires or a re-verification. Um, Citizenship and Immigration Services, the paperwork arm of immigration, also sometimes will issue an I-94 for somebody who's already in the United States. Um, an EAD is an employment authorization document. Um, we basically call it a work card. It's temporary permission to work in the United States, and that's employment eligibility based on a specific classification. Um, a green card that's issued to legal permanent residence, that's their evidence of their legal residency status. Um, an E-Verify is a voluntary process for some employers. Other employers are required to enroll, especially if there's a state mandate to do so, but it's an internet based system that allows employers to confirm the eligibility of their employees or new hires uh, with immigration to work in the United States. It does not replace the I-9. So even if you're an E-Verify enrolled employer, you still need to do the I-9 process as well. Um, some acronyms that we come across, H-1B, um, that's the 800-pound gorilla in the uh, employment visa context. Um, it's a worker in a specialty occupation. It's normally capped at six years, issued in two, three-year grants. Um, sometimes there was an extension possible beyond that six-year period. And H-1B1, it's a great visa classification. Um, it's just for citizens of Chile and Singapore. Um, it's great. I'll get into greater detail later on about it. Um, but it's a, a sister visa to an H-1B. There's an E-3 visa classification as well. That's just for citizens of Australia. It's another great visa classification. Um, and we'll get into that in greater detail later on as well. OPT, if you come across that term, it's optional practical training. Um, it's for foreign national students on their F-1 visa. Um, and it's generally for students that once they graduate, they normally can apply for a one-year work card. And that's how you often as an employer onboard somebody um, with an EAD, with an OPT EAD. Sometimes a student can burn through their OPT uh, while they're in school. STEM OPT is a two-year extension of their one-year work card for graduate. Um, it's available for employers uh, who are E-Verify enrolled and offer a formal training plan to the student. The student would um, present to you the training plan uh, from their school, and it's a two-year work card. Um, so in theory, if you hired a, a recent college graduate who's a foreign national on an F-1 visa, they might be able to onboard with you for a one-year card um, if they're a STEM major, and if you're an E-Verify enrolled employer and you do the training plan, they may be able to get a two-year extension of that one-year card. Um, TM visa classification, another great visa classification. It's for a professional worker. Uh, it's somewhat akin to an H-1B, but it's slightly different. Um, it's just for citizens of Canada and Mexico. Um, a great thing about the TN is there's indefinite renewals possible, and we'll get into the TN classification in greater detail later. Um, these are the government agencies that you're normally involved with in the immigration context. We have the Department of Homeland Security. Um, after 9-11, yeah, the old Immigration and Natural Relations Service was split apart, and uh, three separate agencies were eventually uh, created within the Department of Homeland Security. We've got Citizenship and Immigration Services. They're the paperwork arm of immigration. They handle like the H-1B petitions, applications for citizenship, uh, visa sponsorship. Um, you follow normally paperwork with CIS. Customs and Border Protection, they're a law enforcement agency. They're actually the largest federal law enforcement agency that we have. Uh, it includes the Border Patrol, and they're the agency that protects our borders, and they're the agency that also, when foreign nationals fly into the United States or drive the United States, that'll issue the I-94 to those individuals. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, they're another law enforcement agency, and they're tasked with deportations. Um, and they also administer the foreign student program, the F-1 visa program. Um, the Department of State's involved because they control our, our embassies and consulates, right? Um, they're also involved with some other smaller immigration programs. Um, the Department of Labor, their goal is to protect U.S. workers, um, and they're involved with uh, prevailing wage determinations and labor certifications. So some visa classifications like an H-1B or an E-3, an H-1B-1, and also, if you offer permanent sponsorship, we'll go, they'll start off at the Department of Labor before you move on, sometimes to CIS. All right, so let's get into the H-1B visa classification. So what's an H-1B? An H-1B is a temporary visa. It's a work visa, but it's reserved for a specialty occupation. An immigration divines a specialty occupation is one that requires a theoretical and practical application of a body of highly specialized knowledge and that requires the attainment of a bachelor's degree or higher in a specific specialty or equivalent as minimum for entering the occupation in the United States. What does that mean? Basically, that means it's, it's a position 
that require some knowledge that's normally attained by somebody going to college and getting a specific bachelor's degree or higher. Um, so it's not for an occupation that's going to require somebody with a, uh, an MBA, um, unless the MBA is specialized, um, or a, a liberal arts degree, okay, a generic degree like that. But think of think of your engineers, think of your IT specialists. Um, those are individuals um, or occupations that may qualify for an H-1B, okay, um, or anything involved with analytics. Um, there's a great deal of um, litigation on what is a specialty occupation. Um, a good attorney is going to be able to look at your position description and see what your minimum requirements are, what the duties and tasks are, and give you a pretty quick answer on whether or not they believe this is going to be a specialty occupation or not. Um, sometimes there's some heavy work involved in editing that position description to truly encompass like um, the technical aspects of the position and note that to immigration in an argument of why this is a specialty occupation. What are some of the benefits of an H-1B? Well, there's a thing called dual intent, and dual intent is recognized for an H-1B in that um, if somebody's here on a temporary visa, uh, they normally have to declare that they're going to return to their home country. Um, but a dual intent visa classification allows that individual, your worker, uh, to tell immigration, hey, I actually want to be in the United States forever, or that's something I'm considering, and immigration can't use that against them. On the other hand, if you have somebody who's like a foreign student, or obviously um, somebody here on a, on a visitor, a B visitor visa, they can't, um, they can't express intention to remain in the United States. Um, those are not dual intent visas. Um, some of the issues in the H-1B, and we'll get into this in greater detail, there's a limitation on stay. Um, H-1Bs cap generally at six years um, in two, three-year increments. There's a wage requirement. Um, for an H-1B, an employer has to offer that for a national employer the higher of the prevailing wage or the actual wage. The actual wage is what you actually pay individuals in that occupational classification at the location of employment. Um, the prevailing wage is the wage that's out there in the industry in that geographic area. The Department of Labor's got a great wage database, whether you can use a private wage survey and argue that that wage data is more accurate, but then you're responsible uh, for securing that private wage survey and seeing if the government's going to accept it. But most employers will use the Department of Labor's wage database. Um, there's a requirement for a public access file. Um, when you file an H-1B petition, you're required to have this what we call a public access file with some documents in it um, that's available for inspection to immigration, the Department of Labor, but also to anyone in the public that knocks on your door and says, I want to see your public access file for all your H-1B employees. So you keep it separate um, from the, your employee's personnel file, um, but you need to train your receptionist or the uh, entry level person um, on contacting the appropriate person within your organization to provide a copy of that public access file um, to the individual that asked to review it. Um, increased scrutiny. The H-1B is an oversubscribed visa classification. There's a lot of scrutiny on it with the government. RFEs and denials. RFEs are requests for evidence where immigration can take that petition where you're asking for an H-1B and ask for even more additional information um, when they question some part of that H-1B petition. And immigration obviously can deny an H-1B petition as well. Um, preparing an H-1B petition. So how do you go about preparing one? Um, they're all treated the same by immigration, whether or not you do a, an initial H-1B petition, a transfer, a renewal, um, and they're all generally prepared in the same manner. Um, basically, you take the position description um, and see if it qualifies for a specialty uh, occupation, and you work with the employer on trying to address and edit that position description, include the minimum requirements and responsibilities to present a strong argument to immigration that this is a specialty occupation. And we also look at, at the same time, and see what the appropriate occupational classification is going to be with the Department of Labor. See what options might be out there and look at the prevailing wage, right, um, to see if you're going to be able to, your actual wage we also know about, because that's the wage that you're offering the employee. We'll also want to make sure that, that you're paying your new hire the same amount as you are for your other employees. And if there is a difference, to articulate a lawful basis for the difference in the wage. Um, but we look at the prevailing wage, and sometimes the prevailing wage is a deal stopper. Um, where you're not able, to, not able to afford to raise that wage of your H-1B employee or new hire to meet the prevailing wage requirement. Um, and then we compare the position and the employee's credentials to determine and make sure that they're qualified. So if you're going to be sponsoring somebody to be an IT specialist for you, great, we've got a great position description, you're able to pay the, 
the required wage, but if that person doesn't have um, an IT-based degree, a bachelor's degree, um, that's going to be a deal stopper as well. Um, and this is the part where we, we modify or edit the position description. Sometimes an employee gets a big pay raise um, for doing an H-1B. Um, we prepare what's called a labor conditional application, not to be confused with a labor certification, um, but basically it's a public posting. Uh, where you're notifying your workforce that you're preparing an H-1B and it provides them with an address that the U.S. Department of Labor did complain. Okay, and we also prepare the public access file where most attorneys will prepare that for you and not ask you to rely on, or rely on you to prepare it. Um, so after we receive that certified labor certification, labor conditional application from back from the Department of Labor, um, we prepare the H-1B forms for citizenship and immigration services. Um, and a support letter for the employer, and we filed a petition with immigration away for a response. So that's, in a nutshell, quickly how you prepare an H-1B petition, and that normally takes around a month uh, to do. Um, that public posting that's required, there's several different ways to do the public posting, um, but normally an employer is going to choose um, to do an actual printed posting in two locations at the location of employment, uh, for 10 working days um, in lieu of emailing all the workers at the location of employment and um, attaching a PDF or putting it up on their internet. Um, so as I mentioned earlier, an employer is required to pay at least the higher of the prevailing wage or actual wage for the position just for your H-1B employee. It's not, you're not required to do so for your entire workforce, but sometimes since you have a public posting, which is noting not only the prevailing wage, um, but what you're actually offering to this individual. It's not going to have their name on it, um, but if you've got a small workforce, they may notice that and they may have a wage issue uh, with your entire workforce. Um, and once again, you're required to have that public access file, um, which is going to have it in like a benefits memorandum, an actual wage memorandum. Um, it's going to have uh, the prevailing wage and show how you receive the prevailing wage, copies of pay stubs to show that you're paying that employee um, at least the prevailing wage. Um, it'll have a retention sheet and some other instructions as well. The H-1B visa classification, as you probably over, uh, heard, is oversubscribed. Okay, so new H-1B petitions are generally subject to an annual lottery, um, and there's approximately around 85,000 new visas available, and 20,000 of those are reserved for recipients of a U.S. master's degree or higher. Um, renewals and H-1B transfers are generally not subject to lottery, um, renewals definitely not so. Transfers, as long as that individual that that's porting over to your organization from another entity, as long as their H-1B was counted against that annual cap, um, they're not subject to lottery as well. I'm saying generally 85,000 because um, while there are 85,000 new bases each year uh, for cap subject employers, uh, there are a certain number of them that are carved out for the H-1B1 classification for citizens of Chile and Singapore unused portions from the previous year are rolled into the next fiscal year. Um, and there's a very few number of those that are taken out from Chile and Singapore. So you generally have around 85,000. Um, in the old days, um, just a few years ago, actually, um, employers had a five-day window uh, to turn in a paper application to immigration. So you'd have to prepare the entire H-1B, uh, incur the labor, incur the legal fees, um, and then actually um, send them off to immigration. Um, and later on in the year, immigration would hold the lottery and announce the winners. And then at some point over the summer process the petitions and they would actually physically return the unselected um, H-1B filings and they won't cash the checks. The checks will be attached to it. And if you go on a search engine, you'll find stories like in the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal with great photos where they're showing this huge traffic jam of these huge Immigration Regional Service Centers. I mean, these are basically huge offices that immigration has um, where they process H-1B petitions where you see a line of hundreds of UPS trucks and FedEx trucks um, waiting to deliver pallets of H-1B petitions. Um, and immigration resisted disclosing how they actually conducted the lottery. Um, uh, but the workers like from UPS and FedEx would say they would drop off these loads outside uh, and there would just be stacks and stacks of these H-1B pal these pallets with saran wrap sealed um, with thousands of petitions within each pallet. Um, and they weren't sure what immigration was doing with it. Immigration resisted informing it when there was a lawsuit and immigration instead came up with an electronic lottery, um, which was a great option. Um, now we have an electronic lottery. Um, so now what we have is a registration process, in fact, where 
instead of physically turning in petitions. Um, immigration each March will announce that they're going to, one, they're going to hold a lottery, and there's a window for employers to register uh, and to finalize an H-1B registration submission. And around March 30th or 31st, immigration will announce who's been selected um, and then provide a window to file, um, a 90-day window to file later on in the summer. Um, so the great thing about the registration process now is um, there's a small amount of labor involved in registering for the lottery. Um, and then if you don't win, you've saved all that time and energy in preparing an H-1B petition for your cases that weren't selected. Um, so a lot of results, okay. Um, if you take a look here at this chart, what we see here is uh, the fiscal year. So the government's fiscal year starts each October 1st. Um, so what we have here, like for fiscal year 2021, which would start October 1st, 2020. So the H-1B window would have been in March 2020. Uh, we had around 275,000 registrations. Um, but you'll note here in the next column, el eligible registrations, and there's a slight ding on that versus the total registration. And those are just registrations that failed. So the registration itself was improper, where the employer made a mistake on the registration. Um, the fee to the registration bounced, and I believe it's like a $10 fee. Um, there was something wrong with that registration itself where the employer made a mistake. Um, and so what we've got here are, are basically most of the registrations go through and they're eligible. And in the next classification, we see eligible registrations for beneficiaries with no other eligible registrations. What immigration clunkily here is stating is that, hey, these are the registrations for which you indicated, hey, I've got this employee or candidate, and that person is not on any other registration. Um, so what we have here is that column where you notice, hey, that there's now in that first column for fiscal year 2021, we had 269,000 eligible registrations. Of that, around 241,000 um, is just one registration for that candidate or that employee that you have. And then you'll notice in the next column, eligible registrations for beneficiaries with multiple eligible registrations. So that's an individual, your employee perhaps, that's noted on more than one registration. So an employer is supposed to only register an employee or a candidate just once within the entire organizational chain. So if you have related entities, they're not supposed to be filing a registration for that individual as well. And sometimes, right, the left hand doesn't know what the right hand's doing. So you may have an individual that's working for um, your main entity and there's an affiliate um, where that candidate was expressing interest on transferring into. They didn't, that HR division didn't realize what was going on, and there were two registrations that were filed. Not supposed to do that, but that sometimes happens. But most often what happens here is that you have a completely separate entity um, that was filing a registration. So what you run aware of was that either this candidate uh, he, who you haven't filed, hired yet um, has sent out resumes and had several employers say, hey, I'm going to file an H-1B registration for you, um, or it's your current employee um, that's out there on, on Indeed.com um, and getting another job offer and that other organizations filing a registration form. So what you're seeing here is that an uptick as well, right? Um, not only a number of total registrations, but there's a dramatic uptick in that other uh, that column there, eligible registrations for beneficiaries with multiple eligible registrations. So if you look at this current cycle here right now, um, until the end of this month, we're still in fiscal year 2024, um, I mean, what you see here, I'm sorry, for the upcoming fiscal year 2024, this past March, we had 780,000 registrations, uh, which was unprecedented, right? So an increase of almost 300,000 from the previous year. Um, and it turns out that over 400,000 of those were multiple registrations for the same individual. And immigration's actually opened up a criminal complaint um, and they're investigating employers where they think they've gained the system and they've created other entities or they worked in collusion with another entity um, to file multiple registrations for the same candidate, um, hoping that this person would be selected by one of the organizations. Uh, like staffing firms may have done this with related staffing firms as well. Um, that dwarfed the number of actual registrations where you had only a single registration. Uh, selections are in the final column here, so if you see here in fiscal year 2021, the, the initial year of the registration process, you had, um, you basically had around 124,000, 131,000 the next year, 127,000 last year. And this year, initially, we had 110,000, um, but they immigration recently 
made an additional selection of 78,000 more registrations because of this criminal complaint where they've determined that enough of that 110,000 were going to be denied um, through the, the gaming, the, the scheming that employers had done, according to immigration, to gain this system here. Um, what do I tell most employers about the H-1B lottery? We basically have around, historically have around a 20% chance of winning if your, your employee or candidate has got a bachelor's degree or higher. If they've got a U.S. master's degree or higher, they've got a slightly higher percentage um, of around, around 25%. So historically, you're looking at around a 20 to 25% range uh, for selection in the H-1B lottery. Um, we go here to H-1B extension. So if you're lucky enough to have an H-1B for your employee, um, it's normally issued for up to three years, um, and you can get a renewal, and it'll be for another three years. Sometimes due to the, the nature of that underlying LCA that's required to be done ahead of time or, or travel abroad, you might be able to get a request uh, for slightly more than three years, I mean, um, slightly more than six years. Because if your employees outside the United States, for any 24-hour period that they're completely outside the United States, later on you can ask to recapture that day or days um, in a future H-1B cycle. Um, there's also another way to, to go beyond six years. And generally, this is for individuals um, that are born in India, and to a lesser extent, individuals that are born in um, PRC, uh, where there's a long wait list for a green card. And if an employer undertakes the labor certification, a permanent sponsorship process, and if they're not able to secure their legal residency, um, you're able to get either a three-year extension or a one-year extension based on where they're at in the process. And you're able to get multiple extensions in that. Okay, so there's three increments and there's also one-year increments as well. And generally what you're, you're looking at is an individual, um, like for born in India, where they're gonna be getting three-year renewals of their H-1B if you've undertaken the labor certification process and hit certain benchmarks there. For an H-1B transfer, Basically, this is great. It takes around a month to prepare an H-1B transfer, um, but basically have an individual here um, who has an H-1B already. Um, they're looking to, to port to your organization and take their H-1B with them. One of the things we're looking at initially is, is that H-1B approval portal, um, have they been counted against that cap in the past? And we look at what organization were they working for previously, um, and we're doing all that in addition to making sure that you're going to meet the prevailing wage requirement that this is a specialty occupation. And we also try to look at is if they've been counted against the lottery in the past, how much time was left, right? Because what they've got is they've got six years total um, in an H-1B. That goes with the individual, assuming they're not from India or, or PRC and had um, that permanent sponsorship process initiated on their behalf from a previous employer. But basically, they've got six years. What you kind of don't want to do is end up with somebody who's only got a year to go um, and you're going to spend all that money on an H-1B um, and you may not have time to go beyond the six-year mark if they happen to be born in India or PRC. Um, that you hire should continue to work for their current employer until they're able to transfer. Um, and they can transfer once immigration has received um, the transfer petition from your organization. So they don't, you don't need an approval from immigration um, you just need a receipt notice or evidence that immigration has received that H-1B petition. Sometimes new hires do not want to work for you with simply the receipt notice and want an approval notice. Um, it's taking immigration currently right now around two to four months to process an H-1B petition, but an immigration allows an employer to pay what's called premium processing and pay an additional $2,500 to try to get a decision within 15 days. But to recap, like that new hire can transfer and they can start work for you uh, immediately once immigration has received the H-1B petition. Uh, what do you do about a transfer if somebody's already been terminated from their current employer or they're about to be terminated? Immigration needs that transfer petition from you, that H-1B petition, um, within 60 days uh, of the last date of employment um, for your new hire. So if your new hire was terminated from organization A on September 1st, we've got 60 days from September 1st, okay? Um, so we need to count up how many days have them been terminated. And what we look at is the pay stubs from your from your uh, new hire. Um, and looking at not the pay date, um, which sometimes lags, 
Um, but what was the actual pay period for that pay stub and how many hours were they credited with to try to calculate what the actual termination date was? But ideally, you have a candidate um, who's working for their organization and is only going to come transfer over afterwards. And so they haven't been terminated yet. Um, some common issues, and we've gone over this earlier here for each one of the petitions. Um, one of the most common issues we have is a really vague position description, which may work great for your organization, um, but it's going to be too vague to substantiate a specialty occupation um, each one of position. So we'll work on editing that position description. Um, another issue is if you require more from your applicants in terms of education experience than allowed um, with the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, if your salary is too low for visa sponsorship, that's a pretty common one as well. Um, uh, if you don't, if your employee doesn't possess the required minimum qualifications, so this comes up a lot, especially in the IT field, where you have an individual who's great because they've got great experience, right? They have a mechanical engineering degree, um, but they've somehow got into the IT sector. Um, unfortunately, it's not going to substantiate an IT-based um, H-1B petition here. Uh, we've got an issue here, and sometimes you'll encounter a candidate who has an H-1B approval in the IT field, um, but with increased scrutiny from immigration now, they're catching these approvals that they've done in the past that they should not have done, um, where the individual does not have the required education. Um, sometimes you have an issue as well where that employee, we don't have uh, evidence that employees in lawful status here in the United States. Um, immigration is supposed to um, look at all the I-20s, so if you have an individual who's an F-1 student, um, they're, they're issued I-20s from their college, um, and sometimes they don't keep them all. Well, we're supposed to submit to immigration a copy of all their I-20s to show they've always maintained their F-1 status as well. Um, and additionally, current pay stubs and WTs for previous years, if you have an H-1B transfer to show that they've always maintained their status here in the United States. Um, and H-1B employees has some special rights. So they have generally the same rights as all your other employees, right? So um, one additional protection for an H-1B employee is that um, they're required to be paid higher than the prevailing wage or actual wage, whereas your regular workforce, you're paying them the actual wage, what you think they're actually worth here, right? Um, but here, for an H-1B employee, you're supposed to pay higher uh, uh, than the prevailing wage or actual wage. So whichever one is higher is supposed to meet that um, as a floor for their pay. Um, you're not allowed to have an H-1B employee chip in for the costs of the H-1B petition here. There's been a lot of litigation on that. Uh, especially for organizations that are paying their employees significantly more than the prevailing wage or actual wage to have them chip in. Um, but these employers have lost uh, these cases where um, even though the regulations um, seem to indicate that an employer in that limited situation, an employee can chip in, um, the judges have disagreed. So basically, we ask employers to be a same responsibility for all the fees for an H-1B petition. <laughs> an additional protection for H-1B employees if you terminate an H-1B employee prior to the end date on their visa sponsorship, you must do what's called an effective termination in, in order to avoid the promised wages on the H-1B petition. So when you file an H-1B petition, you're, you're promising to pay an, um, an employee um, that wage, which is you know the higher the prevailing wage or actual wage for a, most often in a three-year time period. Uh, if you terminate them prior to that end date, um, you must notify them in writing, um, offer them um, costs of reasonable transportation costs back to their home country. Um, you must withdraw the H-1B petition from immigration and also withdraw the underlying LC with the Department of Labor. Um, and if you're offering the cost of return transportation home, it's you're offering them basically a check uh, for an airline ticket back to their home country. And it's not the um, airline equivalent of Spirit Airlines when they go back. It's a reasonable airline ticket uh, to go back home um, on it. Um, um, filing fees for uh, H-1B petitions, it's generally uh, the base fees, $460 is the fee to immigration. Um, there's a first time filing fee of $500 um, and a $1,500 fee as well, um, which for employees that are less than, I think it's 25 employees, then I think it's 750. But generally, most organizations are paying a base fee when you add it up of 2460 for an H-1B filing, and that's just in government filing fees. And then if you're filing premium processing, you're adding on another $2,500. So you're looking at sometimes paying as much as $4,960 just in government filing fees for an H-1B petition.
Um, so you may look at what ways, what are some options to the H-1B visa classification here? Um, if you're not able, if you didn't win the lottery, what are my, my options here? Generally, you have an issue, um, you're onboarding somebody who's an F1 student with their OPD card. Um, if they're a STEM major, uh, and if you're enrolled in E-Verify or willing to be enrolled in E-Verify, if you're able to do that formal training plan, the STEM training plan, then you're able to get two more years of employment authorization from them, right? During that time period, um, I'd recommend that you would be filing them in the H-1B registration uh, for the lottery. Um, so you get more than one bite at the lottery. Don't just do it once, uh, but if you're able to get more bites of the lottery to do so. Um, if you don't win the lottery, um, and if that employment authorization ultimately ends, um, if that student goes back to school um, and goes into a higher level of education, so maybe they came on board, they had a bachelor's, uh, but they're willing to go into a master's program, um, they can go ask for like CPT, that's curricular practical training, where some schools will allow the students to get practical training while they're in school, and sometimes it'll be full-time employment. Um, or if you're able to wait, maybe they graduate from their master's in a year and, and come back with another um, OPT card. Um, that may be one option here um, if you have an F1 student hire. Um, I mentioned earlier the H1B1 visa classification. Um, so it's similar to the H1B, so it's for a specialty occupation. It's limited just for citizens of Chile and Singapore. What's great is we can avoid immigration. So that $2,460 base fee that I mentioned earlier, we can avoid that. That individual can actually apply directly with the U.S. Embassy. Um, or if they're here in the United States, they want you can apply with Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, we still have to do the underlying LCA with the Department of Labor. But this is generally a much quicker and cheaper option than the H-1B. Unfortunately, it's not often that you're going to encounter somebody who's a citizen of Chile or Singapore, so we sometimes don't get this H-1B-1 visa option. Another one's the E-3 visa for Australians, so it's similar to the H-1B. Um, once again, we can apply directly at the U.S. consulate or embassy. We can skip CIS. We still need to do the underlying LCA. Um, but once again, it, the problem is we're not encountering too many Australian citizens here in Michigan. Um, but it's, a, once again, a, a quicker, faster method and a lot cheaper than an H-1B. Um, we've got the TN visa classification for old NAFTA treaty. So it's a professional occupation. So there's actually a list of occupations um, on the NAFTA treaty. It's reserved only for citizens of Canada or Mexico. Canadians can apply directly at the border. Um, Mexican citizens have to apply at the consulate, okay, and then they go to the border afterwards. Um, we can apply with immigration here domestically if they're here already in the United States, but if they're not here, um, we apply either um, with Customs and Border Protection, uh, we prepare a packet, send it to your new hire, and they make an appointment, or they, they go to one of the busier border crossings and apply there or apply at the airport. Um, or if they're a Mexican citizen, we usually start off by providing them with instructions on how to apply uh, for a, a visa appointment and then provide them with the documents they're going to need to present at their interview. Um, it's a faster, cheaper option than the H-1B because we're applying directly with the consulate. Um, professional occupations. So there's a list of occupations, like engineering is listed on the occupation. Um, what we sometimes have to do here is take a look at the the position you're trying to, to fill, right? Um, if it's a materials handler, like, is there a way, can we focus on the engineering duties and responsibilities in that position and maybe retitle the position as like materials handling engineer? Um, the individual though is gonna need, generally need to have the right degree, right? So hopefully they're gonna have some sort of engineering degree that makes sense. Uh, if you're a manufacturing facility, hopefully they've got, you know, manufacturing engineering degree or an industrial engineering degree or a mechanical engineering degree, something that makes sense to the sponsored position. And then we make that argument that the sponsored position falls under the list of occupations on the list instead of arguing that they're especially the occupation. Instead, we're making an argument that it, it's, on, it's on the NAFTA list. Um, this is pretty rare, but you may encounter somebody with extraordinary ability, right? Um, it's your four nationals that have extraordinary ability in the sciences, arts, education, business, or athletics. Um, the occupation doesn't require someone of that caliber or talent, um, but it's for somebody that you're hiring who basically um, they're a rock star. Um, it's a very high bar um, to hit. And when we use this often, it's for like a scientist. So if you've got... Um, a facility here um, and you need a, a data scientist or you need um, an actual like physical scientist um, 
sometimes their resume, their CV is going to support an O1 classification here as well. Um, e visa, not to be confused at E3 for Australians, but we actually have E1s and E2s. Um, it's reserved for citizens of countries where we have a specific treaty with the United States. So we've got treaties with, I think, around 100 nations where we have, most of them would be E1 and E2. Uh, but some of them are just for E1 or some of them just for E2. What's great is we can skip um, going to immigration and apply directly to the consulate. But they're, if they're here in the United States already, we do then apply with immigration if they're not willing to go back to the consulate. Uh, but basically, you're required to have substantial trade uh, or substantial investment uh, in the United States is going to be required. And it's not just for the owners of the organization or managers, executives, but it can be for individuals with like specialized knowledge, right? There's special workers that need to be there. Um, one of the biggest issues here is you got to have a qualifying country. So that nation has to have a treaty with the United States, uh, qualified nationality. So that organization um, that's doing this has to be a citizen of that nation. And we normally show that by saying, hey, they're listed on. Um, the stock exchange of that nation, or if we can show that the ownership structure of that entity, of that foreign entity, is 51% owned by individuals of that uh, nation itself. And then finally, like the employee, if you're trying to bring in a specialized knowledge employee, that employee also has to have the same citizenship of that nation. Uh, so, for example, if you've got a Swedish entity um, where ultimately the, the overall structure of the organization is Swedish, um, we got to look to see, does Sweden have a treaty with the United States? Yes. Okay. Um, and they're trying to open up operations here in the United States or they're purchasing an entity here in the United States. Great. Um, they've got the qualifying uh, substantial investment. And it's not defined, um, but generally substantial investments can be based on the circumstances at hand. Um, and then we need to show that the individual they're trying to bring over. So if they're trying to bring over, for example, um, an engineer, um, that that engineer is actually a citizen of, in this scenario, um, Sweden. B1 business visitors, basically these are individuals that are going to come here. Um, they're not allowed to be have any gainful employment in the United States. They're basically just going to be here uh, for meetings. Um, and that's the temporary visa classifications. Quickly, for permanent, um, you may have an employee that asks about permanent sponsorship. Um, we've got EV1, EV2, and EV3 are the three basic class, the main classifications here. EV1, um, I hate to use this term so much, but basically I'm going to say rock, rock star again, right? You have Lionel Messi here who's playing um, in the United States for MLS soccer. Like, he could have sponsored himself for an EV1. Um, we see it a lot with uh, professors when they come to the United States to, um, to teach at a, at a school that they're sometimes eligible for an EV1 if their CD or resume shows that they're high enough. And, and often we do this for executives as well. If their portfolio um, shows that they're of high enough caliber, are there enough write-ups about them in the press? Um, EV2 are going to be for individuals holding an advanced degree or persons of exceptional ability in the arts, sciences, or business. Um, that's going to be ones basically what we're looking at where the position is going to allow you to ask for like a master's degree or higher. The individual's got it as well. Um, finally, EV3 is the main one. It's for your positions where you either have a position requiring a bachelor's degree or a skilled worker who doesn't require a degree at all. So we've done this for facilities here in Northern Indiana that needed welders. Um, we were able to park them in the EV3 classification and go through this. But basically, it requires you to do a blind test of the labor market to show there's no minimally qualified U.S. workers. Um, and it's a it's a set procedure from the U.S. Department of Labor. Um, you have to rigidly follow um, their steps. And normally doesn't allow you to use requirements or skills that your employee currently gained with you. So if you train up an individual, um, the government's not going to allow you to, to skip that step uh, for a U.S. worker as well. Um, there's a prevailing wage requirement, not an actual wage requirement, but a prevailing wage requirement here as well. This process um, can take two to three years um, for an individual that's not subject to a wait list. But if you're subject to a wait list, um, and usually individuals born in, in India and PRC would be, um, they could be waiting after you've done all this for 15 years uh, for a green card, in which case then you need to continue um, to renew their H-1Bs if they're here working for the United States. This doesn't confer any interim benefits, right? So if you're doing the labor certification process, your employee's not able to work for you unless they have employment authorization. This by itself doesn't confer employment authorization until the very end. 
So when I mentioned like that organization that brought over welders, those welders were abroad. I think they were in Serbia. Um, they, they found these welders. Um, they did a blind test here in Northern Indiana um, where they recruited for U.S. welders, weren't able to find any minimally qualified U.S. welders, um, and then went ahead and notified the Department of Labor, provided them with evidence, and were able to sponsor these individuals, these welders to come in um, from Europe, and now they're working here in Northern Indiana. And that's the permanent sponsorship process here. Um, Allie, I think we've got some questions, right? Yeah, Mike, thank you so much. Um, I I added a Q&A portion, but I don't, no one has added questions there, but I do want to open it up to um, anyone who's on the call that wants to add a, add, ask a question first. Someone's already asked about your presentation, and I assured them that there was, there's one online already, but I think that there may have been a couple of new things you added this year to the presentation, I, I, I believe about the, you know, the updates with the this year's visa process. So um, we, we can add the updated version to the website. So that's that's answered for you. And then um, anyone on the call who'd like to ask a question, feel free to chime in now. Well, Ali, I think you, while we're waiting for new questions, um, I can go through some of these questions that, that were asked earlier. That's okay. Sure. Okay. Absolutely. So we had somebody earlier ask um, if an employee isn't selected in the lottery, how does that affect their current status um, and what contingencies plans should be in place? So like when you register an employee or a candidate for the lottery, it doesn't provide them with any immigration status itself. Like you can register somebody, a candidate that's abroad, that's not even here in the United States. So, but normally it's an individual that's already working for you. So whatever they brought to the table when you, when they onboarded with you and, and did the I-9 process with you, that's their status, right? Um, it may have an end date um, that you need to be mindful from, um, mindful for. So, it doesn't impact their status whatsoever if you don't win the lottery. If you do win the lottery, great, you have an opportunity to switch called change their status from, you know, for example, F1 um, to H1B. If it's approved by immigration, then on October 1st, when the fiscal year starts, then they would switch over from their current status to the H1B status. Uh, what contingency plan should be in place? That's the million dollar question, right? What what is that employee of yours willing and able to do? Are they able to go back to school and maybe find a school that's offering CPT employment? There are a few universities in the United States that have basically a program where they allow individuals, foreign national students to enroll, go to school just like four times a year for intensive week-long classes, do everything else online, and allow you to work for your organization full-time. Immigration, where are these schools? It's an aggressive interpretation of the in-person learning requirement for the F-1 student visa. Um, the main schools here in Indiana do not do this. Like you, Purdue will not offer this, obviously, and the other one, Notre Dame or IU. Um, but there are some other schools that are credentialed real colleges with real campuses that do this. Um, if you've got an individual that's eligible for an O-1, it's gonna be rare, but maybe you can follow the O-1 as a backup in case they don't win the H-1B lottery, but it's gonna be pretty rare um, if they're, if they're from Chile or Singapore or Australia or Canada or Mexico, maybe we shouldn't even be focusing on the H-1B, but instead be focusing on the H-1B-1, TN, or, or E-3 visa classification. So hopefully that answered that question there. Um, another question we had is how long is the H-1B visa valid for? So the, I think by visa here, I'm going to, I'm going to switch back and not talk about the actual visa that's printed inside the passport, but when immigration approves an H-1B, it's normally valid for three years. Um, due to the way we have to do the underlying LC with the Department of Labor and some timing issues, sometimes it might be shorter than three years, but you're able to capture that on the second one, right? On the second one, in the extension, you can ask for the full three years. And maybe if you've been shorted, you know, a few months, uh, or if that individual's traveled outside the United States, you can even do a third one to capture the rest of that six years that you're ultimately eligible for most H-1B visas. Um, does it allow individuals to work in all demand sectors? So it's not based on the, the sector, right? It, it can be in transportation, logistics, manufacturing, whatever sector of employment is fine. It's, it's the occupation itself. Um, the occupation, it has to be a specialty occupation. That being said, there are some industries where you might be able to avoid the H-1B lottery altogether. Uh, if you're a not-for-profit entity uh, and you've got an MOU with a college or university, you might be able to use 
the colleges and universities are exempt for the H-1B lottery cap, um, the numerical cap. So if you're a not-for-profit, you have an MOU that's valid, you might be able to file an H-1B petition um, and claim exemption based on your active MOU um, on that. Um, so that would be the one area where I guess it would be dependent on the sector, right, the education sector and related not-for-profits. Um, another question was, I have a teacher identify with a master's qualification, but need help getting them here. Um, so unfortunately, it, it'd be an issue of, like, what's the nationality of the teacher? Uh, can we avoid the H-1B lottery, like if they're from Chile, Singapore, or Australia, or um, if they're from um, Canada or Mexico? And if not, it's the H-1B lottery, um, unless maybe they've got a family connection and you can help them through a family visa, um, which would benefit you because they maybe perhaps have employment authorization when it's all said and done. Um, but there's nothing special here uh, for a teacher other than um, if you're a, a school district, um, even though formally you're not a 501c3, immigration treats you as an offer profit as a school entity. Um, most schools have an active MOU with a college or university, uh, like with student teacher placement programs. Um, we need to make sure that these MOUs are valid and active. Sometimes they've lapsed and nobody's recognized it. Um, we need to make sure that they're, they're active and then we can file an H-1B petition um, for, for a school district. Um, I had a couple of questions as well about J-1 visas. Um, so a J-1 is normally for an individual like a postdoc. It's a, it's a weird visa classification that will have postdocs with J-1s, but there are also like au pairs with J-1s. Summer camp counselors have J-1s. But normally in the context with, with employers, it's we have an individual, they're a postdoc, they're finishing up, you know, their PhD. There's a thing called academic training that they can get after they graduate or finish their postdoc. If you've finished up your PhD, you can get three years and 36 months of employment authorization if you haven't burned. If you burned any of it while you're in school, that's subtracted from your 36 months. Anything lower to PhD, it's 18 months. So sometimes you'll have an individual um, on a J-1 where they can, yeah, they'll be able to work for you. There's a DS-2019 is the form that the school will issue, and that's the form, one of the forms they'll use when you do the I-9 for them. You can enter that J-1 in the H-1B lottery, um, and then if they've won the lottery and if you win the h1b they would change their status from j1 to h1b on october 1st one thing to note about j1s some j1s have what's called a 212e um, two-year return home obligation uh, where they receive funding perhaps um, for their their advanced studies for the postdoc studies in the united states um, or their their phd and they're supposed to go back home for two years to pay that back right take the skills that they obtain here in the United States and make their home country a better place by going back for two years. Obviously, some folks don't want to go back, right? Um, they'd rather be here because we have greater economic opportunities. Well, they're supposed to then get a waiver of that. They're either supposed to go home for two years or get a waiver. Um, the waiver process is pretty complicated, um, It's, but there are some avenues for it. One, it's going to be based on persecution, um, but the most common one to try to get is a no objection statement where the home government will say, hey, we don't need you to come back. Um, it's fine for you to stay in the United States. Um, you cannot get that no objection statement, though, if that individual received their funds from the U.S. government. So if they're a Fulbright scholar and those funds came from the U.S. Department of State, um, the United States won't recognize a no objection statement from their home country because we gave them a scholarship for the purpose of getting these skills or education and going back home and making their home a better place. Then they're going to have to pursue a different avenue uh, for a J-1 waiver. There was another question um, that just came in. Uh, what are the registration dates for the next fiscal year? If you know those already, Mike. Great. Um, no, because immigration will wait to the very last minute. Um, at some point in March, in early March, they'll announce it that they're going to have you know a 10 day or 14 day window later on in March for the registration process. Um, and that's when the employer to register and also for the registration of specific candidates to be done by. They'll close that window, and they're they're tight on closing that window. Um, there there's no exceptions on that, and then unannounced, um, they will announce who the winners are. When they announce the winners, you'll know as an organization that you've won. Like your employees are going to ask you, "Did we win the lottery?" They'll know because the immigration will send you an email with a PDF attached to it. They'll also email your uh, attorney if you, if you have an attorney on it as well. Um, it'll say that you've won, 
and it'll be the instruction sheet on filing each one petition. It'll note the deadline. It'll note the employee's name. If you don't win, they're not going to notify you. Um, your case is then your registration is held in advance in case they do a subsequent drawing later on in the year. Um, so this year they've done an unannounced subsequent drawing because of the suspected fraud, right, from those additional 400,000 registrations for the same individual. Last year, I don't believe they did any additional drawings. Um, I think the first year they did one or two as well as they were getting the kinks out on their data, right? And because they, they're trying to calculate, okay, if we've got 84,800 visas or whatever number they've calculated that they have, um, let's look at last year's denial rates. What are industry hiring trends? How many do we think we're going to need to, how many registrations do we need to approve in order to hit our quota of 84,000? Because they want to give out every one of these H1B visas they're allowed to give out. Um, and I think that first year they were way conservative and they had two unannounced subsequent drawings. At the end of the fiscal year, um, all the unselected registrants, and if you go to the portal, it'll still say submitted. It won't say anything else. It'll say selected for ones that were selected, denied for the ones that were denied because he did an improper registration. But at the end of the fiscal year, the unselected ones that, that are saying submitted will switch and it'll say not selected at that point. Uh, that's when they've actually officially closed it at that point. Another question came in that says, if we find a candidate that needs an H-1B today, what's what's the process? What are next steps? They should probably reach out to their immigration counsel um, or their attorney to see, hey, like, are we subject to the annual cap? Is there a way to get around it? Is there another visa classification that we go through? It, does this position qualify for an employment visa? Does this candidate qualify? Um, to, to have like a, a consultation to see what options might be available. Do we have any follow-up questions from the attendees? Uh, we had some general questions, you know, in the sign-up, we had some general questions about, you know, student visas. And um, I think that you went into that, Mike, already. Um, people also ask what kind of talents are needed in the Michiana area, um, and I think that we, um, you know, from the from the city side, we can we can tell you that we, you know, H one B visas don't encompass all of the kinds of jobs that we need, right? You can't get an H one B visa for every kind of job that's needed, um, but we know that we have a lot of need in the healthcare sector. Uh, we know that we have a lot of need in manufacturing. Um, and uh, we can get some more specifics that will be up on the website to answer these, you know, kind of an FAQ section. Um, I, we have something else that just popped up in the chat. Okay, just said thank you. Um, well, with that being said, we're already over time, so I don't want to take up anyone else's time. If anyone has questions, please um, feel free to email me and to visit our website, um, which I already put in the chat. I'm putting my email address in the chat here as well. I wanted to just let you know that in October, we will be hosting um, a networking session for um, for college you know, students that are in the US and employers that are local. So please uh, join us for that. We'll have some updates on when that will take place on our website and we'll email you if you attended today. Um, and that would be a good way to meet potential candidates um, for your job openings. Um, and yeah, just, Keep keep your mind keep your uh, eyes out for for when we have our, our next career fair as well, which will be a few days after the networking event. Um, and thank you so much, Mike, for your time. And this was a great presentation. And we'll put that up on our website. Hey, thanks, Alex. Thanks, everybody. Take care.